Bobby is missing? Liam's voice echoed down the empty hallways. Mrs. Perkins could feel her heart drop. She had promised to protect Liam, to shield him from the truth of what had happened. But it seemed like it was too late. Liam's eyes, wide with a mix of confusion and fear, reflected the innocence of a child who had just stumbled upon a harsh reality. We... we didn't hear you, Liam. Doug began shakily. I couldn't sleep, Liam said. I knew there was something going on. Is that why I haven't been home? Is that why I'm staying here? Doug and Mrs. Perkins exchanged a look. They had vowed to protect Liam, to shield him from the harsh reality of Bobby's disappearance. But the truth had a way of surfacing, often when least expected. Liam, sweetheart, Mrs. Perkins began, her voice trembling with the weight of the situation. Bobby, he's on a little trip, that's all. Doug, standing beside her, nodded in agreement, though his eyes betrayed the unease of their fabricated story. Yes, he's just gone for a little while. Don't worry, he'll be back soon. Liam's young face, usually so full of childlike wonder, twisted into a frown. His eyes, bright with a keen intelligence beyond his ears, searched theirs for honesty. A trip? Why didn't he tell me? And why do you look so sad if he's just on a trip? The questions hung in the air. Mrs. Perkins and Doug exchanged a look, a silent admission of their failing strategy. Please, I want to know the truth, Liam pleaded, his voice cracking with the onset of tears. I'm not a baby, I can handle it. Mrs. Perkins knelt down, her eyes level with Liam's. She took his hands in hers, the warmth of her touch a small comfort. Liam, we didn't want to worry you. <sighs> Bobby, <sighs> Bobby is missing. We're trying very hard to find him. Doug joined her, adding gently, We didn't want to upset you, but you're right. You deserve to know the truth. We all love Bobby, and we're doing everything possible to bring him home. Liam's eyes welled up with tears, a mixture of fear and understanding dawning on him. Is Bobby gonna be okay? He asked, his voice small and shaky. We believe so, Liam, Mrs. Perkins said, her voice steady despite the turmoil in her heart. We have many good people helping us. We have to stay strong and believe that Bobby will be back with us soon. Liam, his small hands still enveloped in Mrs. Perkins, looked up with an earnest desire for understanding. But how did Bobby go missing? What happened? His voice was filled with a blend of curiosity and concern. Mrs. Perkins sighed before she decided to tell Liam the full truth. All right, Liam, Martha began, pulling back to look at him. Bobby's disappearance seems to be connected to someone, a man named Shackleton. We think he took Bobby, but we don't know why. Liam's expression changed to one of realization and anger. Shackleton? The realtor? He asked, his small frame tensing up. Mrs. Perkins nodded solemnly. The very one, she confirmed, her voice heavy with regret. Liam's young face hardened, a mix of fury and understanding lighting up his eyes. I knew there was something not right about him, he exclaimed, his voice tinged with indignation. He always gave me a weird feeling. I can't believe he has Bobby. Doug wrapped a comforting arm around Liam's shoulders, drawing him close. It's okay to feel angry, Liam. We all do. But it's also why we always say we need to be careful, even with people who seem nice on the outside. Not everyone is who they appear to be. Liam, still seething with a child's straightforward sense of justice, insisted, I want to help find Bobby. I want to do something. Mrs. Perkins knelt down, holding Liam's gaze with a serious yet gentle look. Liam, we understand you want to help, and it means a lot to us. But it's too dangerous for you to get involved. We need you to be safe. Things would be far worse if we lost you, too. Doug nodded in agreement, his voice firm but kind. Your job is to be here, to be safe and to be ready for when Bobby comes back. We have a lot of people working to find him, and we promise to keep you updated on everything. Liam's shoulders slumped, a mixture of frustration and acceptance washing over him. Okay, he said softly, his anger giving way to a sense of helplessness. Just please find him. Mrs. Perkins hugged him tightly, whispering assurances. We will, Liam. We're doing everything we can, and we'll bring Bobby home. Then Liam sat up. But I still want to help, he reiterated, his voice firm. 
Doug, understanding the turmoil churning within Liam, offered a gentle alternative. The best way you can help right now is to be a comfort to your parents. They're worried too, and having you there strong and brave will help them a lot. Liam pondered over Doug's words, the idea of being a source of strength for his parents resonating with him. Can I go home then? He asked, a hopeful tone in his voice. Mrs. Perkins and Doug exchanged a knowing look, silently agreeing. They had partially kept Liam at their house to shield him from the harsh reality of Bobby's disappearance. But now, with Liam aware and wanting to be with his parents, it seemed right to let him go home. I think that's a good idea, Mrs. Perkins said softly. Your parents will be happy to have you with them. Doug gave Liam's shoulder a reassuring squeeze before stepping away to call Natalie, arranging for Liam's return home. Meanwhile, Mrs. Perkins and Liam shared a quiet, heartwarming moment. She looked at him, her eyes reflecting both sorrow and pride. Liam, you've grown so much, she said, her voice quivering with emotion. You're becoming so strong and brave. You're such a good big brother. Liam leaned into her, seeking comfort in her embrace. I just want Bobby back, he murmured. I know, sweetheart, and we're doing everything we can. Mrs. Perkins reassured him, holding him close. You being strong for your parents and Bobby is the best help you can give right now. Doug reappeared at the doorway, his expression grim. They're ready for you, Liam, he said. Are you ready? Liam nodded. As I'll ever be, he said. With that, Doug led Liam to the car and escorted him back to the clear mansion where Bryce and Natalie waited anxiously. The moment he stepped through the door, the emotional dam broke. Liam, seeing his parents, burst into tears. Natalie, tears already streaming down her cheeks, rushed to him, engulfing him in a tight embrace. Oh, Liam, I missed you so much, she sobbed, her voice choked with emotion. Her relief at seeing him safe was evident. Liam clung to his mother, his small body shaking with sobs. I, I don't ever want us to be apart again, he managed to say between his tears, forcing the deep fear that had taken root in his heart. Bryce, standing a few steps away, watched the scene with a mixture of relief and burning anger. He was the very picture of protective strength, his handsome features set in a determined expression. Despite the turmoil within, he maintained a strong exterior, a pillar of support for his family. When Natalie and Liam finally parted, Bryce stepped forward, his arms enveloping them both in a firm, reassuring hug. We're going to get through this, he said, his voice a steady anchor in the storm of emotions. Shackleton has torn our family apart, but I swear I'll do everything in my power to bring Bobby back and make sure he pays for what he's done. Liam, still held in the circle of his family's embrace, looked up with determined eyes. I will help, Sue. I want to do everything I can to find Bobby, he said. Natalie, gently stroking Liam's hair, looked into his eyes with a mixture of pride and sorrow. Liam, just having you here with us, safe and brave, is more than enough. Your support means the world to us, she assured him, her voice warm and comforting. It's not fair, Liam said his words tinged with a sense of injustice only a child could feel so deeply. Bobby shouldn't have to go through all of this. Bryce, his expression softening as he looked at his son, agreed. You're right, Liam. It's not fair at all. And that's why we're going to do everything we can to make things right. Liam's face dropped. I just don't know why this is happening, he said. Liam, Bryce began, his voice steady but soft. Sometimes in life, we encounter people who do bad things, people who might cause harm. It's a hard truth, but it's important to know. Natalie knelt down beside Liam, adding, But knowing this also helps us be more aware, more cautious. It helps us protect ourselves and the people we love. Liam, his eyes wide and thoughtful, looked up at his parents. Does that mean good doesn't always win over evil? He asked. His voice tinged with a newfound understanding of the world's complexities. Bryce and Natalie exchanged a look, a silent acknowledgement of the difficult truth. They realized that they couldn't promise Liam an always happy outcome, that the world was more nuanced than simple tales of heroes and villains. Before they could respond, Doug interjected, his voice imbued with a reassuring confidence. Liam, in life, there's no guarantee. But what we can do is try our best, fight for what's right, and never give up. Good people coming together to do good things. 
that's how we make a difference. And that's what we're doing for Bobby. Liam looked at Doug, taking in his words. A small smile crept onto his face, a sign of reassurance and trust. Turning to Doug, who stood by the doorway, Bryce's expression hardened into one of determination. Doug, we need to intensify our search efforts. We have to explore every possible lead and follow every clue. We can't leave any stone unturned. Doug nodded, his own resolve mirroring Bryce's. Absolutely, Bryce. I'm with you every step of the way. We'll expand the search, coordinate with the authorities more closely, and utilize every resource at our disposal. We're bringing Bobby home, no matter what it takes. With that, the family stood together, united as ever. They had to find Bobby at any cost, and Bryce was determined to make it happen. The conference room at Star Entertainment buzzed with anticipation. Jill, Devin, and Tony had gathered for a meeting about the production of the film, The Notepad. The room was filled with creative energy and hummed with a sense of purpose. Devin was eager to discuss the project, and he was also determined to alleviate the unspoken personal tension between him and Jill from when he had confessed that he wrote the notepad for her. Despite Devin's obvious feelings for Jill, she had responded to his emotional revelation by requesting that they focus on the film for now. Devin didn't want to ruin their friendship, so he hoped that if he could focus on the film in production as Jill had asked, then eventually she would look at him as more than a friend. But for now, Devin was unsure if he had inadvertently altered his and Jill's friendship, as well as the course of the film project. If he could use this meeting as a return to business as usual, and if Jill did too, then he knew things between them might be okay. The meeting commenced. Jill addressed an issue with the budget, and then asked Devin to talk about his vision for the direction of Tony's character. Before Devin spoke, Jill's phone buzzed on the table. When she glanced at the screen, her brows furrowed with concern. Excuse me for a moment, I need to take this, she announced. Then she stepped out of the room to take the call, and the door closed behind her. Devin and Tony exchanged puzzled glances. Devin leaned in toward Tony, his curiosity peaked. Jill's voice is usually steady and composed, but... I feel like that brief exchange carried a note of distress. Whatever news she received seemed to have hit her hard. I should go see if she's okay. Tony gestured for Devin to stay seated. Let her have her space. If she wanted us to know what the call was about, she would have stayed in the room. Devin couldn't shake the feeling that something significant was unfolding beyond those closed doors. He exchanged glances with Tony, who mirrored his uncertainty. The low murmur of Jill's voice leaked through the closed doors, but her words remained unintelligible. Seconds turned into minutes, and the atmosphere in the conference room grew tense as Devin and Tony waited for Jill to return. The door abruptly swung open, and Jill re-entered the room. Her composure, usually unshakable, now faltered. Devin, concerned, asked, Jill, is everything okay? Jill hesitated, her eyes briefly meeting Devin's before shifting away. I have to go. She said, her tone evasive. The meeting is canceled for now. Devin, puzzled and slightly alarmed, stood up. What happened? Is everything all right? Jill offered no further explanation. With a determined expression replacing the distress in her eyes, she picked up her things. Then she walked past Devin and Tony toward the door, leaving them with the weight of unanswered questions hanging in the air. Instinctively, Devin moved to follow her, but Tony's firm hand on his shoulder stopped him. Let her go, Devin. Seriously, if she wanted us to know, she would have said something. Tony advised, his tone measured. Devin, torn between his concern for Jill and the professionalism of the moment, hesitated. He glanced at the closed door, frustration etched on his features. But what if something's wrong? Tony sighed, understanding the conflict within Devin. <sighs> if it's something she wants to share, she will. For now, let's focus on our work and hope whatever it is, she handles it okay. Devin reluctantly nodded and took his seat once again. The unresolved tension lingered in the room and cast a shadow over Devin and Tony's discussion about film scenes. The fate of the notepad is so insignificant at this moment, Devin thought to himself. He wondered what mysterious and distressing news interrupted their meeting and had Jill leave with no explanation at all. Without Jill there, Tony saw no reason to continue the film production discussion with Devin so the two men had agreed to wait to hear from Jill about rescheduling. Tony left Star Entertainment with an uneasy feeling about the abrupt departure of Jill. He tried calling her, but received no response. In his concern, he then attempted to reach Natalie, but again he encountered the same silence. 
With a growing sense of unease, Tony decided to call Mrs. Perkins, hoping for some clarity. Mrs. Perkins, have you heard from Jill or Natalie? He asked, his concern evident. Mrs. Perkins took a deep breath before revealing the heartbreaking news about baby Bobby's disappearance. Her voice was steady but tinged with sadness. Tony, dear, I wish I had better news, but baby Bobby is missing, she began. Tony's heart sank as he struggled to absorb the shock. He understood the gravity of Jill's abrupt exit. His voice barely above a whisper, Tony responded, Missing? How? How did this happen, Mrs. Perkins? Mrs. Perkins continued to explain the situation, including the desperate search for Natalie and Bryce's little one. The weight of the news settled in. Tony's mind raced with worry. Where are they now? Do you know if Jill is with them? He asked, his Tony mix of concern and determination. All I know is that Natalie and Bryce are with Doug, and they have some kind of lead that they are pursuing. If Jill just heard the news, then my guess is that she wants to comfort Natalie. But I can't give you any more information than that, because I don't have any at the moment. I'm here taking care of Liam. Tony instinctively knew where he might find Jill. Thank you, Mrs. Perkins. You've been very helpful. If you hear of anything more, please keep me informed. I will, Tony. Without wasting a moment, Tony hung up his phone and went to his car. He headed to Natalie and Bryce's house. Although he was worried, he was also determined that Jill should have someone to talk to. Upon arrival at the Claire home, Tony spotted Jill sitting in her car. Her eyes were fixed on the house, as if waiting for the couple to return. Tony approached her with a solemn expression, acknowledging the weight of the circumstances. Jill, lost in her own thoughts and visibly shaken, turned to see Tony approaching. Tony tapped on her window. Jill put her window down. Tony saw a mix of sadness and worry reflected in her eyes. Tony, understanding the need for support, didn't utter a word, but simply slid into the passenger seat of Jill's car. The silence between them acknowledged the depth of their shared concern for Natalie and Bryce and the safety of baby Bobby. Jill tried to hold back tears. Tony placed a comforting hand on her shoulder and offered a reassuring squeeze. The engine hummed softly, but the stillness of the car echoed the heaviness of their hearts. In the quiet of the car, Tony finally spoke. I had a feeling that I'd find you here. I'm waiting for Natalie and Bryce to come home. I want to offer support in person, but maybe it's not enough. Tony's voice was filled with compassion. Jill, we're here for them. Whatever they need, we'll support them through this. Jill nodded, grateful for the unspoken understanding between them. The weight of the situation seemed momentarily lifted by the shared empathy of two friends. The anticipation of Natalie and Bryce's return loomed. Jill didn't know if they would be coming back with good news, or if the unthinkable had happened. The air inside Jill's car felt heavy with unspoken emotions, but it was as if Tony knew what Jill was thinking. Jill, we need to remain positive, Tony encouraged. Jill tried to nod, but even that was difficult given how upset she was. I'm trying to, Tony, but I feel so much pressure right now. Should I be focused on the movie production? Hundreds of people are counting on it for their jobs. I don't want to let anyone down. I don't want to let Natalie down, but I know she needs me here too. Tony continued with a sincerity that resonated through the confined space. Jill, I get it. The notepad is important, and a lot of people are counting on it. But right now, you're dealing with something even more significant, a baby's life. Your support for Natalie and Bryce is invaluable, and it's the right thing to do. Jill's eyes glistened with a mix of gratitude and inner turmoil. I appreciate your understanding. Yet the weight of responsibility for the film project tugs at my conscience. Tony, I want to be there for Natalie and Bryce. It's just the notepad has so much writing on it, and I don't want to let everyone down. Tony reached over and gently placed a hand on Jill's shoulder. He offered a comforting squeeze. Jill, you're not letting anyone down. Life throws these curveballs at us, and sometimes we need to reassess our priorities. Right now, supporting your friends is what matters most. Everything else can wait. Jill nodded. You're right, Tony. I just need to find a balance, but it's not easy. Tony smiled. The warmth of his gaze met hers. You're handling it better than you think. Being there for people you care about, especially in times of crisis, is a testament to your character. That's why I respect and admire you so much, Jill. Jill's cheeks flushed slightly. She was touched by Tony's words. Thank you, Tony. That means a lot to me. The vulnerability in the car prompted Tony to share a sentiment he had been holding back. 
Jill, there's something I've been meaning to say. You're not just someone I work with. You're someone I deeply care about as a person, and, well, you're important to me. The weight of unspoken feelings lingered between them. Jill turned to look at Tony. Her eyes searched for the sincerity in his gaze. You're important to me too, Tony. The depth of their connection had slowly surfaced. The acknowledgement of their feelings brought a subtle shift in the dynamics of their relationship. Tony continued, his voice gentle but sincere. In moments like these, when life reminds us of what truly matters, it becomes clear who we want by our side. And Jill, I want to be there for you. Jill's heart fluttered. Emotions swirled within her. She felt the gravity of Tony's words and the unspoken connection they shared. Sitting here with you, Tony, at a moment like this is... Well, I'm just so grateful. I feel that this deeper connection holds the promise of support and understanding. And perhaps... Jill's voice trailed off. Tony waited for her to say more. When she didn't, he asked, perhaps what? But before Jill could answer, the headlights of Natalie and Bryce's car appeared in the distance. They're home! Jill exclaimed. Tony wanted to finish their conversation, but he knew that it was time for Jill to offer the support and comfort that Natalie and Bryce undoubtedly needed, so he didn't push it. Tony and Jill stepped out of the car, ready to embrace Natalie and Bryce with compassion and understanding. Putting their feelings aside, Jill and Tony were determined to present a united front against the storm that had unexpectedly entered the lives of the Clare family. Devin pushed open the door to the dimly lit bar. The soft murmur of chatter and the clinking of glasses welcomed him. He settled onto a stool and offered a tired smile to the friendly bartender behind the counter. Hey there, the bartender greeted with a nod. What well, can I get you? Devin ordered a simple whiskey on the rocks. The bartender poured the drink and Devin nodded his thanks. Devin took a sip, letting the warmth of the alcohol seep through him as his eyes instinctively found the neon beer sign clock behind the bar. He stared at the clock. As the minutes ticked by, each one added a layer of anticipation that blended with the undercurrent of frustration he felt at Jill leaving their meeting so abruptly without a reason. Devin's gaze remained fixed on the clock as if in a trance. His thoughts replayed the awkward moment when he confessed to Jill about writing the notepad with her in mind. He shook off the memory, determined to push aside his negative thoughts. The bartender, noticing Devin's contemplative state, broke the silence. Another round? He offered, a friendly smile accompanying the question. Devin sighed and glanced at the near-empty glass in his hand. Yeah, why not? He replied, grateful for the distraction. As the bartender prepared the second drink, Devin's mind continued to drift between anticipation and frustration. The bartender put the fresh whiskey in front of him, and Devin took a sip. The alcohol provided a momentary escape from his thoughts. The bartender sensed the tension, so he attempted to engage Devin in conversation. So, what brings you in here tonight? The bartender asked, trying to lighten the mood. Devin managed a slight forced smile. <sighs> Just needed a break, you know, he replied vaguely. More minutes passed, and the uncomfortable silence lingered. The bartender made another attempt to ease the atmosphere. Everything all right? He asked, wiping down the counter. Devin glanced once again at the clock. <sighs> I don't know, he admitted, the frustration in his voice betraying his emotions. As time passed, Devin's impatience morphed into exasperation. He sent a series of text messages to Jill, questioning her whereabouts and expressing his concern to mask his frustration. Hey, Jill, hope everything's okay. Jill, just checking in to make sure everything is all right. Hope you're okay. Is everything all right? Let me know when you can. Hey, no pressure. Just want to make sure everything is fine. Feel free to reach out. Jill, I'm starting to get a little worried about you. I'm here for you if you need anything. Unbeknownst to Devin, Jill's phone was tucked away in her bag. The texts he sent went unanswered because Jill was navigating the heart-wrenching task of supporting Natalie and Bryce, who were in crisis. In an attempt to change the subject, the bartender shared a brief anecdote, but Devin's mind remained preoccupied. Devin swigged the rest of his drink and pushed some cash across the bar, signaling the end of his stay. Thanks, he muttered, nodding to the bartender as he left the bar. That night, Devin's insecurity reached its peak. 
Convinced that Jill was deliberately avoiding him, he battled his demons and sent a series of increasingly anxious messages. He was worried that his actions were causing Jill to second-guess him as the director of the notepad, or maybe that Now Star Entertainment wasn't going to film the movie at all. The tension born from Devin's insecurities and the misinterpreted circumstances simmered beneath the surface. Devin was convinced that it had cast a shadow on their professional relationship. The next day, Devin went to Star Entertainment with the hope that Jill would be in the production office. He decided to confront the situation head-on. Jill was not there. Devin slumped in his director's chair. His mind raced with the possibilities of the damage he had caused. Devin was so caught up in his thoughts that he failed to see that Tony had arrived. Devin! Devin! Hey, Devin! Tony snapped his fingers in front of Devin to get a reaction. Devin sat upright. Oh! Hey, Tony! Tony sensed that the atmosphere in the production office was tense from the moment he walked in. Seeing Devin completely immersed in something other than the script in his hand confirmed that something was on Devin's mind. Tony wanted to know what Devin was so engrossed in thinking, but first he had big news to break. He took a deep breath. Devin, we need to talk. It's about Jill. Devin gave Tony his full attention, concern etched lines on his face. What's going on, Tony? Why is she acting so distant? Did she tell you something about me? Something I did? Something I said? Tony hesitated for a moment before delivering the heavy news. This isn't about you, Devin. Baby Bobby has been abducted. Natalie embraces son. Jill just found out yesterday and it struck her hard. Natalie isn't just our boss. Natalie and Jill are friends. Or should I say more like family. Jill rushed over to their house because they're going through a nightmare right now. Shock and worry flashed across Devin's face. Oh my God, that's terrible. How can I help? What can I do? Tony placed a comforting hand on Devin's shoulder. First, we need to understand that Jill's mind is understandably elsewhere. Her focus is on that right now. That's why she's been so distant. Devin nodded. The gravity of the situation sunk in. Of course, family comes first. We should be there for her. Tony continued. I've talked to her, and she's dealing with it, doing everything she can to support. She's worried sick, and that's why she wasn't herself yesterday. It's not personal, Devin. Devin exhaled, trying to process the information. I had no idea. No wonder she seemed so preoccupied. And why hasn't she answered any of my texts or voicemails? I need to support her through this rather than worry about me. Tony nodded. Exactly. I'm sure she would appreciate your understanding. We need to be there for her, both as friends and colleagues. Right now, she needs our support more than ever. Jill's well-being should take precedence. Should I reach out again to offer my support? Devin asked. Tony shook his head no. I think you've left plenty of messages already. Jill will contact us when she's ready. Devin echoed advice Tony had given him earlier. Give her space. Yeah, but in the meantime, I think we should carry on with the movie production, don't you? It might take some of the pressure off her, Tony suggested. Devin hopped off his director's chair. Agreed. The two men shared a determined look. A sense of solidarity emerged between them, strengthening their bond beyond the confines of filming the notepad. Later that morning, Tony and Devin sat in the quiet corner of the production office, surrounded by scattered scripts and storyboards. They were rehearsing a pivotal moment in the film, and it was a moment that meant a lot to Devin personally. Devin fidgeted, and Tony sensed that something was bothering him. Hey, Devin, you suddenly seem a bit on edge. What shifted? Everything okay? Devin sighed. His eyes reflected a mix of nerves and vulnerability. Tony, I need to talk to someone, and I trust you. I need to get something off my chest. It's about Jill. Tony's heart skipped a beat, knowing all too well about his own unspoken feelings for Jill. Sure, Devin, what's on your mind? Devin took a deep breath. His words were laced with sincerity. <sighs> I can't hide it anymore, Tony. I have feelings for Jill. I'm in love with her. And it's driving me crazy not knowing how she feels. Tony's expression remained composed. He did his best to mask the turmoil within. Devin, that's a tough spot to be in. Jill's an amazing person, and I can understand why you feel that way. Unaware of Tony's own emotions, Devin continued, I don't know what to do, Tony. I want to tell her, but I'm afraid it might ruin our friendship and our work on the film. I almost did that once and don't want that weirdness again, but I can't stop what I feel for her. Tony chose his words carefully. Devin, these things take time. 
You don't want to overwhelm her, especially during this time. The worry over baby Bobby and the film production. Devin looked at Tony, seeking guidance. But what if I miss my chance, Tony? What if I wait too long and she moves on? Tony forced a reassuring smile to conceal his inner turmoil. Devin, sometimes the best things come to those who wait. Give her time, focus on the film, and things will work out. If it's meant to be, it will happen naturally. As Tony offered advice, he suppressed the pang of his own unspoken feelings. He realized that sometimes supporting a friend meant sacrificing one's desires, but his feelings for Jill were strong. Devin clutched the script for the notepad and paced nervously. I hear what you're saying, Tony, but I can't help being on edge. He continued with a mix of excitement and anxiety. Tony, we're about to rehearse the big scene. As you know, it's the moment when the lead, you, finally pours his heart out to the girl he's loved for years. It's intense and emotional, and I need it to be perfect. This scene could make or break the film. This isn't just about the film, is it? This scene is personal for you, isn't it, Devin? Tony nodded understandingly. Don't worry, Devin, you've got this, he said with a reassuring smile. And I'm ready to bring the character's emotions to life. The rehearsal began, and Devin observed the scene unfold through the camera monitor. His eyes were fixed on Tony and the actress portraying the love interest. Tony, I need you to dig deep. Feel the weight of those unspoken words. This is the climax, the emotional peak. Let it all out. Devin coached, his passion evident in his voice. When the scene rehearsal was over, Devin approached Tony with a mixture of relief and excitement on his face. Tony, that was incredible! You nailed it! He praised. A proud smile crossed his face. This is the heart of the film, Tony. The raw emotion you brought to the scene is exactly what we needed. Devin commented, his eyes reflecting admiration. As they were wrapping up for the day, Tony asked, Devin, do you ever wonder if life imitates art? I mean, pouring your heart out like that on paper so I can act and pour out that same emotion on screen. Have you ever felt that way in real life? Devin confessed, yeah, Tony, I have. The notepad is more than just a script to me. It's inspired by my own experiences, my own unspoken feelings for someone. Tony looked at him, a mix of surprise and curiosity in his eyes. He pondered for a moment, then asked, You know, Devin, that really struck me, what you just said about unspoken feelings. Do you ever think it's too late to tell someone you love them? Devin looked at Tony, a hint of vulnerability in his eyes. I don't know, Tony. I like to think that it's never too late. That's the essence of the film, and it's a universal truth. Sometimes I admit, however, it's tough to find the courage to speak your heart, especially when it means you might be risking everything. Devin then wondered if it was too late to tell Jill how he really felt, and Tony was thinking the same thing. Natalie and Bryce made their way to the police station, a sense of urgency propelling them forward. They were determined to get the latest updates on the search for Bobby and to provide any additional information they could. As Natalie and Bryce entered the police station, they were immediately recognized by Police Chief Ralph Stern. His reaction was a mixture of professional recognition and something less appropriate, his eyes widening as he took in their presence. Well! If it isn't Bryce Clare himself, the media mogul, and this must be the stunning Natalie, Stern exclaimed, his smile a little too wide. He extended his hand to Bryce, who shook it with a restrained professionalism. Bryce looked at him blankly. The urgency of Bobby's disappearance weighed heavily on his mind. Yes, we're here for a very important matter. But before Bryce could say any further... The police chief began introducing himself. My name is Ralph Stern, head of the police here. It's an honor to meet you, Mr. Clare, sir. I feel like with your power as head of the Clare Corporation and my role as police chief, we would make a formidable team. Bryce, trying to steer the conversation to the matter at hand, replied, Thank you, Chief Stern. We're here regarding a very serious matter. Our son Bobby has gone missing. We're looking for any updates on the investigation. Natalie, standing beside Bryce, offered a polite but forced smile. It was clear she was uncomfortable with Stern's overly familiar manner. Stern, however, seemed to barely register the urgency in Bryce's voice. Ah, yes, the missing boy case. But first, let me say, Natalie, you're even more beautiful in person, he said, his gaze lingering a moment too long. Natalie backed away uncomfortably. Then Stern turned his greedy eyes over to Bryce. And Bryce, leading the Claire group, that's quite the achievement. I'm sure you have your hands full. 
Natalie, her patience wearing thin, interjected. Chief Stern, we really need to focus on our son. This is a critical situation. The chief chuckled, seemingly oblivious to Natalie's concern. Ha <laughs> ha! Of course, of course. But you know, Bryce, I've always been curious about how you handle such a vast empire. Must be stressful, huh? Bryce's patience began to fray at the edges, the concern for his son overshadowing the need for pleasantries. Chief, please. Our son's well-being is our only concern right now. Can we please discuss any progress or leads in the case? Natalie placed a hand on Bryce's arm. It was a silent signal that they were wasting their time. Stern's inability to prioritize their son's disappearance was not just unprofessional, but deeply concerning. Natalie took a different approach. Chief Stern, we need to talk about Gus Shackleton. We believe he's involved in Bobby's disappearance. Can we please have access to his files? Her voice was firm, reflecting the gravity of their situation. Chief Stern, however, was dismissive. Mrs. Clare, that's confidential information. I can't just hand over files based on a hunch, he said, his tone patronizing. His eyes still lingered on Natalie in a way that made her increasingly uncomfortable. Natalie pressed on, her voice rising slightly. It's more than a hunch, Chief. We have reason to believe Shackleton is directly involved. Please, this is about our son's safety. Stern's response, however, crossed a line. No, no, Natalie, let's not get worked up. A beautiful woman like you should be more composed. Why don't you leave the police work to us men, huh? That was the final straw for Bryce. His face flushed with anger. He stepped forward, his eyes locked on Stern. How dare you speak to my wife that way? My son is missing. And you're standing here making inappropriate comments instead of helping us. Stern, taken aback by Bryce's sudden outburst, tried to regain his composure, but Bryce was not done. Bobby is not just any child. He is my son, and he means everything to us. Your lack of professionalism is appalling. If you're not willing to help, then I assure you, the Clare Corporation has enough influence to take this matter to a level where action will be taken. Bryce threatened, his voice booming in the small office. Stern's face paled, realizing the gravity of the situation and the potential repercussions of his actions. Mr. Clare, I, I didn't mean to offend. We'll, we'll get right on it. Stern quickly disappeared from the room, his footsteps echoing hurriedly down the corridor. The tension in the air lingered even in his absence, with Bryce and Natalie standing resolutely, their expressions a mix of frustration and resolve. After several tense moments, Stern reappeared, his demeanor noticeably changed. In his hands, he carried a stack of files, the very files on Gus Shackleton they had been demanding. His usual arrogance had diminished, replaced by a cautious compliance. Here are the files on Shackleton, Stern said, extending the stack towards Bryce. His voice lacked its previous condensation, now edged with a hint of unease. Bryce took the files without a word, his eyes quickly scanning the topmost documents. Natalie peered over his shoulder, her keen eyes also taking in the information. I... I'm sorry, Mr. Clare. You see, the police department is doing their best, Stern stammered, but Bryce wasn't listening to any excuses. Without another word to Stern, Bryce turned and led Natalie out of the office. His stride was purposeful, each step echoing his unyielding determination to use every piece of information they had just acquired. As they exited the police station, the evening air felt both cool and heavy around them. Bryce held the files tightly against his side. Outside the police station, Natalie finally let her confident front of composure crumble. Tears began to stream down her cheeks, the enormity of Bobby's disappearance finally overwhelming her. She leaned against the car, her body racked with sobs. Bryce, his own heart heavy with worry and frustration, wrapped his arms around her, offering a pillar of strength in their moment of despair. It's going to be okay, Natalie, he whispered, his voice a mixture of comfort and resolve. Natalie looked up at him her eyes red and swollen. How can the police be so incompetent? How can they not see the urgency of finding Bobby? Her voice was laced with disbelief and pain. As he began rifling through the file, Bryce sighed, his eyes dark with the same questions. I don't know, but we can't rely on them alone. We have to take matters into our own hands. We'll find him, Natalie. We'll bring our boy home. Natalie, drawing back slightly, wiped her tears and looked at Bryce. What's in the file? Are you finding anything? Bryce nodded, his expression turning serious. Here's a property linked to Shackleton that hasn't been checked yet. 
It's a bit isolated, not somewhere we'd thought to look before. Hope flickered in Natalie's eyes, a small beacon in the darkness of their situation. Then that's where we start, she said, determination seeping back into her voice. Bryce pulled her close, his embrace both protective and reassuring. I promise you Natalie will find Bobby, and I'll do everything in my power to keep you and our family safe. Natalie rested her head against Bryce's chest, drawing strength from his words and presence. Thank you, Bryce, she whispered into his chest. Anything for you. Bryce murmured back. I would do anything for our family. The pain of Bobby missing was nothing like Natalie had ever felt before, and she was determined to bring him home. The drive to Shackleton's remaining property was tense, each mile bringing Natalie and Bryce closer to a potential answer that they had been desperately seeking. As they pulled up to the location, a sense of apprehension filled the car. Bryce parked and turned off the engine, casting a glance at Natalie. We're here, he said, his voice steady, but laden with a mixture of hope and fear. Are you ready? Natalie nodded, despite the nervousness that flickered in her eyes. As ready as I'll ever be, she said. They both stepped out of the car, facing a building that loomed with an air of neglect and mystery. It looks deserted, Natalie said. Bryce nodded, looking through the windows. Why does it seem like it's been abandoned? He wondered out loud. They approached the house cautiously, their steps echoing slightly on the concrete path. Bryce gently tried the door, finding it surprisingly unlocked. As they walked in, they were greeted by an eerie silence. The space inside was big and strangely configured, hinting at a family's presence long gone. Dust covered all the furniture, and cobwebs hung from every corner. Natalie moved through the rooms slowly, her eyes scanning every corner, every shadow. It's like the people living here just vanished, she whispered, the sadness in her voice echoing off the empty walls. Bryce, examining the surroundings, noticed a few personal items, a child's drawing, a family photo with faces faded with time so much they were unrecognizable. Toys left in a corner. This doesn't make any sense, Bryce murmured, his mind racing to piece together the puzzle. What was Shackleton's connection to this place? Was this where he planned to bring Bobby? They continued their search, moving from room to room, hoping to find any clue that might lead them to their son. But with each passing minute, the hope of finding Bobby there dwindled replaced by more questions and an ever-growing sense of urgency. Natalie, standing in what appeared to be a once-loved living room, turned to Bryce. We need to keep looking, Bryce. He has to be somewhere. As Bryce and Natalie methodically combed through the desolate rooms, Natalie couldn't help but feel a sense of dread. She knew something had to be going on. It was left to her to figure out what. Natalie turned into an office space in the back of the house. Bryce pointed out a series of footprints in the dust. It looks like someone has just been here, Bryce said. Then, Natalie's attention was drawn to a manila folder tucked away under a stack of old newspapers. She picked it up, her fingers trembling slightly with anticipation. It seems new, she said. It seems so out of place from how old everything else is. Opening the folder, they found a collection of documents, bus tickets, dated just a few days prior, and a series of receipts. The name on the documents unmistakably belonged to Gus Shackleton. Natalie's eyes opened wide as the implications of this folder suddenly settled in. She gasped. What's wrong? Bryce asked. You have to see this, Natalie replied. Natalie held Gus's manila folder in front of her. A haunting realization crossed her mind one that would change the trajectory of their search entirely. What's wrong? Bryce asked. Bryce, look at this, Natalie said, her voice a mix of excitement and dread. These are bus tickets and receipts, all recent, and they're all from out of town. Bryce hurried over and scanned the documents. His expression darkened as he pieced together the implications. He's left town, Bryce concluded, the realization hitting him like a wave. Shackleton isn't here anymore. He's moved on, but possibly with Bobby. The gravity of their discovery settled heavily upon them. This was a crucial piece of evidence, one that shifted the entire focus of their search. The possibility that Shackleton had taken Bobby out of town opened a terrifying new chapter in the quest to find their son. Natalie's mind raced with worry and determination. We need to act fast, Bryce. If he's on the move, there's no telling where he could be heading. Bryce looked at the receipts and frowned. There's a problem, 
he said, his eyebrows knitted together. What? Natalie asked, her voice raised in concern. Bryce pointed out the destinations on the bus tickets. These tickets only lead to connecting stations. He pointed out, we don't know exactly where Bobby was taken. Natalie frowned. What do we do? Bryce looked forward, determined. We'll alert the authorities immediately, he said. Get them to widen the search. We can use the Clare Corporation's resources to track these purchases and find out where he's headed. They gathered the documents, carefully placing them back in the folder. Every receipt, every ticket was now a vital clue, a breadcrumb on the trail leading to Bobby. Bryce squeezed Natalie's hand. Bobby's my son, Bryce said. I will make sure whoever did this to Bobby suffers. As Natalie and Bryce prepared to leave the deserted property, Natalie's phone rang abruptly, shattering the tense silence. Natalie quickly pulled out her phone, her heart racing. Who could it be at this hour? She wondered aloud, her voice laced with anxiety. She answered the call, and immediately Mrs. Perkins' voice came through, filled with fear. Natalie, it's Mrs. Perkins. I'm at the house with Liam, and someone is trying to break in. I don't know what to do. Natalie's face drained of color, her hand gripping the phone tightly. Mrs. Perkins, keep the doors locked. We're coming right now, she said, panic rising in her voice. Mrs. Perkins' voice clipped in through the other line. I think, I think they have a key, she called out, the panic in her voice clear as day through the phone. Bryce, upon seeing Natalie's reaction, immediately sensed the gravity of the situation. What's wrong? He asked, his voice urgent. It's Liam, Natalie replied, her voice trembling. Someone is trying to break into the house. We have to go back now. Without a moment's hesitation, Bryce and Natalie rushed back to their car. The urgency to protect their other son, Liam, added a new layer of fear and determination to their already fraught state of mind. As Bryce drove back to the house, breaking speed limits, Natalie called the police, her voice steady but urgent, informing them of the situation and requesting immediate assistance. Hello, this is Natalie Clare. I need immediate assistance at the Clare residence, she said, her voice cutting through the static with clear urgency. There's an intruder trying to break into our home. My nanny and son are inside. Please, you need to get there fast. It's an emergency. The drive seemed to stretch on forever, each second feeling like an eternity. Natalie's thoughts were a whirlwind of fear and worry. First Bobby, and now Liam was in danger. It was a parent's worst nightmare unfolding in real time. Bryce's grip on the steering wheel was white-knuckled, his jaw set in a firm line. The determination to protect his family was evident in his every action. We're not going to let anything happen to Liam, he said through gritted teeth. As they pulled up to their house, they saw police cars already outside, their lights flashing in the dark. Natalie and Bryce leapt out of the car and ran toward the house, their hearts pounding. Bryce and Natalie arrived at their house to find the police detaining a figure outside. The flashing lights cast a surreal glow over the scene. As they got closer, Bryce's eyes widened in disbelief. It was his father, Robert Clare. Dad, what are you doing here? Bryce exclaimed, his voice a mix of shock and confusion. Robert Clare, looking equally surprised to be apprehended, quickly explained, I came to check on you all. With everything that's been happening, I was worried. Bryce, realizing the misunderstanding, quickly dismissed the police officers, assuring them that it was a false alarm. The officers, though slightly hesitant, complied and left after Bryce thanked them for their swift response. Once the police had departed, Robert turned to Bryce, his expression a combination of concern and demand for answers. Bryce, what in the world is going on? Why are the police here? In the quiet of the now empty street, Bryce took a deep breath and began to explain the entire ordeal, from Bobby's disappearance to their suspicions about Gus Shackleton and the distressing events of the evening. Robert listened intently, his face growing more troubled with each revelation. The news of his grandson's disappearance hit him hard, a look of deep worry etched into his features. Natalie, standing beside Bryce, added details about their visit to the police station and their recent discovery of Shackleton's potential whereabouts. The air was heavy with tension and worry, the family crisis unfolding like a complex and tragic story. Robert, absorbing the gravity of the situation, placed a supportive hand on Bryce's shoulder. I had no idea things had gotten this bad, he said, his voice laden with concern. You should have called me sooner. We need to do everything we can to find Bobby. Just as the family was grappling with the enormity of the situation, Liam emerged from the house. Natalie, seeing her son, felt a rush of relief flood through her. She quickly ran towards him and wrapped Liam in a tight embrace. Oh, Liam, are you okay? We were so worried, she asked, her voice thick with emotion. Liam, still a bit shaken but trying to be brave, nodded in his mother's arms. I was scared, Mom, but I'm okay, he said, his voice small but steady. 
Behind them, Mrs. Perkins approached, her expression a mix of relief and mild reprimand. Robert, you nearly gave me a heart attack, she said, her tone light, but carrying an undercurrent of genuine alarm, sneaking up on us like that. Robert Clare looked somewhat sheepish, clearly not having anticipated the chaos his surprise visit would cause. I'm sorry, Mrs. Perkins. I didn't mean to startle anyone. I just wanted to check in on my family, he explained, his voice carrying a hint of regret. The family, now reunited under such tense circumstances, shared a moment of lightheartedness amidst the anxiety. It was a brief respite from the worry that had been dominating their lives since Bobby's disappearance. But then, the grim reminder of Bobby's absence hit them once again. Mrs. Perkins, her voice laced with concern, updated everyone. Doug's out there right now, doing everything he can to look for Bobby. He's checking every possible lead, every spot that boy could be. Bryce and Natalie exchanged a determined look, their resolve mirrored in each other's eyes. We should be doing the same, Bryce said firmly. Finding Bobby is our top priority. We can't just sit here and wait. Natalie nodded in agreement, but then added with equal intensity, but there's another priority too. She looked over at Liam. Liam's safety. We can't risk anything happening to him as well. The room fell silent for a moment as the gravity of Natalie's words sunk in. The threat to Liam was just as real, a painful reminder that their family was still in a vulnerable state. Bryce, listening intently, spoke up. We need a plan that ensures both. We can't leave Liam exposed while we're out there searching for Bobby. Maybe we should consider additional security measures here at the house. Mrs. Perkins, still holding Liam's hand, nodded. I agree. We can't take any chances with Liam. He needs to be protected. Robert Clare stepped forward, his expression one of determination mixed with regret. I want to do everything I can to help, he said firmly. His voice then softened as he continued. I feel like I failed as a grandfather. I should have been here, been more involved. Mrs. Perkins, her hand still clasped around Liam's, looked at Robert with a sympathetic gaze. Robert, I understand that feeling all too well, she said gently. We all think we could have done more, but what matters now is what we do next. Bryce, touched by his father's words, nodded in agreement. Thanks, Dad. It means a lot to hear you say that. And right now, we could really use your help with Liam. Robert looked at Liam and then back at Bryce, a newfound purpose lighting up his eyes. Of course I'll watch over him. I'll do whatever it takes to keep him safe and help in any way I can, he declared, his voice resolute. Bryce and Natalie shared a look of relief and gratitude. Having Robert there to ensure Liam's safety allowed them to focus on the search for Bobby without the constant worry of leaving Liam unprotected. As they talked, a small, quiet sob interrupted their discussion. Turning around, they saw Liam, tears streaming down his face, a picture of fear and confusion. The ongoing conversation about his missing brother had become too much for Liam to bear. Natalie immediately rushed to Liam, kneeling down to envelop him in a warm, protective embrace. Oh, Liam, it's okay, sweetheart, she whispered, her voice soothing yet tinged with pain. Bryce joined in, placing a comforting hand on Liam's back. We're going to find Bobby, Liam. We're all working together on this, he reassured, his voice steady and strong, trying to instill a sense of hope in his son. Mrs. Perkins and Robert moved closer, their expressions softening as they too offered comfort. Robert put his arm around Liam. I'll keep you safe, Liam. Don't worry about it, he said. You mean the world to me. Mrs. Perkins gently stroked Liam's hair. We're all here for you, Liam, Mrs. Perkins said softly. You're not alone in this. We're a family, and we'll get through this together. Liam nestled in the circle of his family's love, gradually calmed down, his sobs subsiding into quiet sniffles. Bryce looked up, determined. The reality of Bobby's absence was hitting him stronger than ever, and he had to do something about it.